Hello everybody, my name is John Hammond, and in this video, I wanted to do something new, but not entirely new. Kind of wanted to go back to the channel's roots, where I do a longer video series on one specific kind of technology or programming language, and it's a tutorial series and learning thing, rather than just a capture the flag video write-up like I've kind of been doing lately. So, this video, I want to kickstart the Windows PowerShell video series tutorial. I'm really excited about it, but before we get started... I wanted to talk to you guys about Circle CI. So you probably heard the terms continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment, and that is what Circle CI is all about. Circle CI offers an awesome platform that lets you automate your development of any software, code, and projects that you're working on in a managed, safe, and tested environment. They're working with some big players. They have Facebook, Spotify, GoPro listed here, and I'm sure there are plenty others. And they offer a free trial version. If you're interested in it, you can check out the cloud implementation or the server implementation. And they are all about helping you develop the next best thing. One thing that I especially wanted to mention was that they offer support for Windows. They have incredible documentation, and they offer some fantastic stuff. Everything that they test within the CI pipeline is working on a virtual machine, so it guarantees you have isolation of what you're working with. It's using server core of Windows Server 2019, the latest stuff, and they're using PowerShell. That's the default shell, but you can obviously customize that to bash and old school cmd.exe. Offers a little bit of integration with Docker, and it's just awesome. Awesome. The syntax is in a super simple YAML configuration file, and it could not be easier to test and develop your software within a CI CD pipeline. If that all sounds awesome to you, and I know it does, please go check them out on their website, circleci.com. Take a look through that documentation, see how easy it is to set up this pipeline, and give them a shout. Let them know that John Hammond sent you. They're going to make your development process so much easier. Okay, so let's dive into some PowerShell. I am working in a flat vanilla Windows 10 image. Uh, I just updated it to the 1903 update. Um, and I need to put forth my usual disclaimer that I do in most of my videos in that I am not by any means a professional. I'm not a Microsoft MVP by any stretch of the imagination. So if I ever misspeak or if I ever relay some information to you that is wrong and some of you guys are veterans and rock stars and totally know, whoa, John, you messed up on that, let me know. Please say the word. Constructive criticism in the comments. We're all here to learn, and that's what I'm all about. So uh, please do just let me know. Hey, John, you're being an idiot. But let's get started. This is going to be an introductory video. It's meant to be an introduction video, so it's going to be some light lifting. What I first want to cover is just for one thing, opening up PowerShell. So I hit the Start button, or just the Windows key in my keyboard. I'm kind of a keyboard guy. Uh, I like to be on the command line. So I would just type in PowerShell. Uh, in that search bar there, and you'll see it pops up. Okay, Windows PowerShell is the app we can work through. There are a couple others listed, though. You have Windows PowerShell ISE, which is their, I don't know that acronym, <laughs> uh, Integrated Something Environment, Software Engineering. Uh, it's a, text editor is not the right word, but it's an IDE, normally that Integrated Development Environment uh, for creating PowerShell code and PowerShell scripts. We're going to get into a lot more PowerShell scripts later on in the series. For now, just baby stuff, trying to get our feet wet. You also see po Windows PowerShell with that parentheses x86. So what is that? That's that 32-bit rendition of Windows PowerShell. doesn't really matter which one we start. Um, the 64-bit one is just normally what we'll be working with, just that we're running a 64-bit PC, very, very likely. And of course, they have that 32-bit version of ISE. Uh, you can just click on that or hit Enter to go ahead and start it up. Um, to note, sometimes when we're going to be doing some things later on in the series, hopefully, uh, we'll be working with commands that will need administrative privileges. So if you ever want to open up PowerShell, with administrative privileges, you can obviously just right-click on that and hit Run as Administrator. Um, what I like to do, personally, is just CMD or PowerShell. That's what this video series is on. <laughs> and I just hit Control-Shift-Enter on my keyboard, and that will go ahead and ask me, with administrative privileges, do you want to run this? So, there we go. Windows PowerShell starts up, and we are ready to rock. With the administrator PowerShell, note that it puts us in Windows... System32 as our path. If I were to open that up in simply my user account, it puts me in, once it gets there, C users John. So that's my user profile or kind of my home directory equivalent in the Linux world. And that's the prompt, right? That's just what's going to tell us that we are in a directory. 
If you ever wanted to change directory, you can move with that CD command we've seen in every other system shell between bash or cmd.exe, etc., etc. You can CD to period, which is that symbol for the current directory. So see our path had not changed. If I were to CD period period, that'll move us up a directory. That means our parent directory. So now we're in C users. If I were to run a command like dir, what you would normally expect in the cmd.exe world, you'll note that, okay, here's a directory listing of the current directory that we're in. So I can see John is an option there. That's that folder I was just in. And we can CD all the way to that. And using that as a relative path, that means from the directory I'm currently in, we can move to the directory that is next to us or in the same uh, folder and tree that we're in. I slid into John and that works just fine for us. And that was a relative path. If I wanted to use an absolute path or going from the very, very root of the file system or any drive that I'm working with, you could specify all of the paths subsequent. So I'd say CD, C colon backslash users, and I'll just go straight there. And that's the absolute path rather than going up with the two periods using a relative path. So that's that easy, simple navigation around the PowerShell command line, right? You guys know the CD command. But you'll notice that I ran the DIR command, and some of you PowerShell purists might already be angry at me because the DIR command in PowerShell is not so much a command. And me even saying the words command when I'm discussing PowerShell is already inherently wrong. So PowerShell refers to everything that you end up typing at the prompt as a command let. So if I were to say something wrong, like uh, please subscribe, cool, yeah. PowerShell will try and track that down, but suddenly it'll get angry at me. It'll get that black uh, background and red text. My screen gets bloody. I, <laughs> PowerShell yells at me. That says, please subscribe is not recognized as the name of a commandlet. And that's what PowerShell refers to everything that it's going to be working with as. Nor is it a function or a script file or operable program. Check the name. Maybe you had just a stupid command. You, you mistyped something. Obviously, that's not something we can run. Please subscribe is not, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, it's not something we can just type into PowerShell and know to do things automatically. It's not a commandlet. And that's what PowerShell wants to get across, is that everything that you type in let prompt should be a commandlet. And commandlets in PowerShell normally have the uh, syntax verb hyphen noun. Normally there are two words or uh, three words, it depends on the lengths get uh, commandlets. Commandlets get more and more complicated or you're doing more advanced stuff. Maybe there's more to what that syntax looks like. But generally you can base uh, the look of a commandlet based off of that verb noun structure, verb hyphen noun. And they like to use the kind of camel case structure. However, PowerShell is case insensitive. It does not matter if you type in um, a commandlet with random capitalization or that expected kind of camel case notation there. So I'm using control L by the way, to clear my screen. Um, CLS works just as fine, just as well. Um, clear might also do it, yep. And the reason that CLS and clear work the same way and the same way that DIR works just as easily, LS also works if you are a kind of more of a Unix or Linux guy, but those aren't the commandlets that I was just talking about. The commandlet that we're looking at, or what we're actually running when we run dir or ls, is actually get hyphen child item. And that'll list out the children of the current directory, right? But commands like dir, or these the syntax here like dir and ls, those are actually aliases for that get child item commandlet. So if you want to see, wow, okay, they're, it's an alias, right? It's a nickname. It's a convenient shorthand thing. If you're more used to being a, a Linux guy working with Bash and you just type in ls or rm or move, and those commands are different from the usual cmd.exe uh, copy or move or del, stuff like that. If you want to see those aliases, you can type in the command like get alias, and that lists out a bunch of stuff, right? We could go through this. We could take a look, and there is a lot of information that's returned to us see all of these kind of nicknames for commands. CLS is in there, just as we saw. Cat might be used to that in the Linux world. 
CP, copy, just as I was talking about. And those all refer to copy item as the real commandlet that you're running there. But those are just aliases that you're running. Now notice that the output of these commandlets is kind of in an interesting format where they ha are kind of formatted like a table. Where they're given kind of a header here with a piece of information that might vary for each thing that's returned to us. The same thing that we saw when we ran dir or ls. Again, I should be running the full get child item commandlet. That's more PowerShell pure. I am kind of inherently a Linux guy, though, as you've seen probably see from other videos. So uh, if I end up typing those ls or cat and said, please don't get angry at me. <laughs> I know I should be using the PowerShell side, but that habit will grow hopefully the same way yours will as we do more of this. So I was just talking about, though, these kind of headers or the information title for each of the entries that's returned from us or returned to us when we run a commandlet. So what are those things? Well, this is where I wanted to talk about kind of the fundamental shift and what happens when you're using PowerShell versus Bash or CMD.exe or C shell or K shell or any other any other system shell that you're probably used to. PowerShell works with the input and output that's like coming out on the screen, not in the normal text-based stream orientation. You know, on Linux, you have standard output, standard input, and you can pipe and redirect those as you would normally uh, in cmd.exe. PowerShell turns that on its head. Uh, we're no longer working with just plain text, but we're working with objects. We're working with C Sharp and .NET Framework, kind of the back end of Windows objects. Each of these is returned to us as some specific thing. So when they go down the pipeline, or when we're working in PowerShell and we're passing objects from one command to another, as you would normally in a pipe in, in Linux or in Bash, you're piping objects into each other. So let's let's try that. Let's let's see if we were to run get child item. Here are our things, right? Here are the current directories and the users folder. And let's say I were to pipe that, and pipe is that vertical bar. Right? It's kind of above your enter key, the shift rendition, the shift rendition of the backslash key. And we can pipe it to something else. We can pipe it to, let's say, select. And select object, I think, is the actual full title name. Right? So select object doesn't look like it did anything to our output. It didn't really specify anything at all. That's because select argument, excuse me, select object needs another argument or some other uh, representation of what to do with the data, or some configuration tweak as to how that programmer command is going to operate. So the way that we can do that is by supplying an argument. And an argument is meant to be the information and data that follows a command or commandlet. The commandlet's the very, very first thing you type in here, get child item or select object. Because we're piping them, they look like they're kind of put together, but they are, in fact, different commandlets or commands, the arguments or the parameters, and I'll say those words often interchangeably, are the things that you supply after. They are separated and tokenized by a different space that separates them apart. So let's say I wanted to select the object name, and that will return just John or public, as that is the name of what I'm actually receiving here. Now that's something that we supplied to select object name as so that's what we're focusing on. That's what we want to filter and zoom in on. But we can actually supply more information to select object. I'll clear the screen here. Let's say we wanted to select hyphen first one. Now that makes sense, right? I'm selecting the first object. And I'm able to do that because of that hyphen first, and that's a parameter and argument that I'm supplying a new value for, first one. And once I hit enter, now all I see is John. Public isn't there anymore. You could do that very, very same thing with like last, or you could index. And when you index, it's zero based. So index zero actually refers to the very first entry, John in this case. And if we wanted to zoom in on that, we can keep piping more and more to grab a specific property out that we wanted. We could select object name and just get John returned to us. Note here that PowerShell is still going to give us that kind of header. Oh, sorry. 
Ubuntu, my virtual machine is kind of getting in the way there. So we can drill down and figure out more and more properties or information regarding that object. If you wanted to get more regarding that, you could actually check out get member, pipe it what you're working with, pipe the object that you're working with into get member, and you can see more information as to what that object actually entails. Talks about properties, which are like variables that for that object, or methods, which are like functions that that object can perform, right? Like delete, if we wanted to end up deleting that. Okay, that's getting really annoying. <laughs> Sorry. You could get files if you want to see, okay, there's a new files in there or move things to them or just convert that to a string, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see, okay, these are the arguments that that uh, method or property might expect or what kind of type that property or variable is. Is it a Boolean value? Is it a string? Is it just text or stuff like that? PowerShell is really, really awesome about giving you kinds of types or structures for information. Like if you want to have an IP address, there's a PowerShell property and, and a format for an IP address. You don't have to try and kludge that together with your own regular expressions or validation. PowerShell will do that all for you. And we'll play with that in the future. For now, I just wanted to get these ideas across and that you can explore an object more and more and get more information out of it that you wouldn't have seen before. So we didn't see uh, root or parent displayed in that regular output when we just simply wanted to grab the first item here. Grab first one. You don't see root or parent in there, but if we wanted to select that, select object parent, then it will return it to us. Uh, note that select is the alias or shorthand notion for select object, so you can just use that if that's a little bit easier to type and quicker for you. But when we're returning that information, we're returning that in a very PowerShell-like way. There's a different way to do that. Um, if you kind of just got the object that you want to work with here, let's say we got just this directory, because we're selecting the first one in our current directory listing, what we can do is actually encapsulate that in parentheses here. An opening parenthesis at the very start and a closing parenthesis at the very end. That will just say, now I'm going to make this object as something that I can work with. So we can run those methods or access those properties in kind of a more programming-like way that you're used to. Uh, maybe more like a C-sharp style or syntax rather than the PowerShell pipeline. We could, if we wanted to, write dot name and we'll retrieve just that property, just that string here. Remember, if we were using that with select name, it gives us that PowerShell header. And maybe that's not the output that you want. If you're trying to avoid that, one option, one way you could go about that is just using that kind of C-sharp style by wrapping the object that you're working with in parentheses and then using a dot selector to work with things. Or you could do methods, right? You could try and run some of those things that we saw in getMember. GetMember is fantastic. GetMember is awesome because it'll let you explore and track down some of the properties or variables or values or information that you're really looking for. I think a lot of using PowerShell is a very exploratory action because you're just kind of discovering where in this web of Windows stuff <laughs> can I find the information I'm actually looking for. That might be how you play and get to know PowerShell a little bit more. So uh, that is what I can think of for everything that I want to talk to you about and show you in this video. We talked about what aliases are. We talked about what a command or commandlet and arguments and parameters are. And we took a look at what the get member commandlet would do for us. Let's just explore an object. But before I go, actually, I thought of it now. I want to show you how we can get help or learn a little bit more about a specific commandlet. If I were to run get help on select object, that'll give us some more information as to what we can do with this. It's like the man page for PowerShell, right? The manual. This is what we're actually working with. Here's the commandlet there. And it shows you some arguments or parameters you could pass through it, just as I talked about last or first or others here. And we'll explore these more in depth. But for now, I just want to show you basically what get help can do for you, because it'll give you even examples if you wanted to get more information. This is a shot in the dark here, but let's run get help on get help. Okay. Cool. It will tell us how we can get help. You could actually ask for more information by using stuff like hyphen full. Let's say, let's get the full help on that select object commandlet. 
It tells us what it outputs, what it inputs. It even shows us more information on what all of these parameters do. And it could give us some examples in some cases. If you don't know the name of the commandlet that you're looking for, or what you particularly want to be investigating, or how you want to work with stuff, you can try and get help on things like printer. And you can separate these by stars, or the asterisks, because it'll act like a wild card, right? Anything surrounding the word printer on either end, or if we were to add one, only a star or asterisk at the very, very end, it says everything that starts with the word printer. Let's try with the asterisks around there. That will showcase, these are all the commandlets that you could use. Maybe you wanted to run set printer or get printer or rename or add printer, etc. Or you could do that with stuff like networking, right? Get help on network. And then you can grab more information by finding those different uh, commandlets. Also, PowerShell has a get command commandlet that will show you everything that you could potentially do within PowerShell. And if you wanted to search or filter through that, you absolutely could. If you wanted to say get command on printer with those asterisks and stars around it to track stuff down. So that's how you could navigate or explore or poke around in PowerShell. We'll do more of that in the coming videos, but I wanted to get this introductory stuff out first. I want to get lay the foundation and kind of start tilling the ground for what we'll be doing in the later videos. So thank you guys for watching. I really, really hope you enjoyed this. I'm super excited about the series. I hope it'll be a lot of fun. I hope it'll be much higher quality than anything I've done before. So uh, please let me know. Leave a like, comment on the video, hit that subscribe button, the bell thing. I don't even know what it does. It doesn't do anything. Uh, join the Discord server. There's a lot of incredible people there. Um, shout out to all of you guys. I cannot thank you enough for all the support that you give me. And I'll see you in the next video.